Yeah, so first of all, uh, yeah, this, uh, we're, the hope is that we would go to the Donbass, to Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, for me, it would be my third time in Donetsk in, in, since the special military operations began. And the goal really is, I mean, first and foremost, we're here in Russia to um, really make a statement that Russia is not our enemy, that we want peace with Russia, to uh, reject this move towards World War III, which we're all very uh, concerned about. And specifically, we want to go to Donbass to be able to talk about the realities there about the fact that this war did not start in 2022, that it started in 2014, and that uh, the people of the Donbass have been fighting for their liberation since 2014 in the face of repression from the government in Kiev, and also show, you know, all the work the Russia's done since the special military operations, you know, to do reconstruction and even first-time construction there, because the Donbass was greatly neglected by the government in Kiev for years, because they were seen as second-class citizens, because they were known to be uh, Russian-speaking, to have pro-Russian sentiments, pro-Soviet sentiments. And uh, the government in Kiev really neglected those areas uh, for a long time. Um, I was actually, in, on another note, in, the Her in Kherson, Oblast in January, I think, February. And um, what was notable to me there, and that's another, you know, new region of Russia, old new region, is we would drive on roads of mud for hours. Literally, there were no paved highways for miles. And why was this? Because the government in Kiev did nothing for those people either. You know, and finally the Russians are building roads, they're building hospitals. They're actually doing something for those people. And that's important for people in the West to see, to understand that Russia, this is not a war against the people of Ukraine, which Vladimir Putin has made clear many times. Um, this is not a genocidal war, as the West claims, like the war in Gaza is a genocidal war. Um, this is a war to, first of all, def defend the people of the new regions against repression and attacks by the government in Kiev, but also to de defend the homeland of Russia because, you know, the fear was that Ukraine was poised to attack the Donbass in 2022, and if they had done that, they wouldn't have stopped there. They would march into Moscow. So, um, all, the, all those are things that we need to talk about in terms of the reality of the situation. And from a human rights point of view, that's what I want to talk about. I'll give an example. So I spoke at the U UN Security Council on Friday about the conflict. And one thing that the, uh, the UN, the person from the UN who opened the um, session talked about she said 11,000 civilians have been killed since the beginning in special military operations. Of course, what she didn't mention is 14,000 people had been killed already before the special military operation. And no one in the West understands this, right? This has been utterly ignored and buried, that history of those 14,000 people. And those are the people that need to be spoken for. You know, we talk about the voice of the voiceless, which St. Oscar Romero of El Salvador talked about. You know, we need to be the voice of those people of the Donbass who suffered through that. And that's what we hope to do. So what are the goals of the United States and Ukraine? I mean, the main goal of the United States and Ukraine is to attack Russia. Ukraine is a mere proxy for that. They don't care about the Ukraine. They don't care about the Ukrainian people. All they care about is, is fighting Russia to the last Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a goal that the U.S. and the West, collective West, have had. It is certainly going back to Napoleon in the early 19th century, is to destroy Russia. Then, of course, it was to destroy the Soviet Union after 1917. Uh, and, and the people of Russia reasonably thought when the Soviet Union went down in 1991 
that Russia would be admitted to the West, and they'd be welcomed, and they'd be part of Europe. But that was never the goal the West had. The goal of the West was then to destroy Russia, which they did. They managed to do pretty well in the 1990s. They did destroy Russia economically. Two million people died in Russia prematurely because of the economic dislocation, because of the vulture capitalism that descended upon Russia by by the West through their surrogate at that time, the drunkard Boris Yeltsin. Um, and, and what they resent most about Putin is that, in the words of the Sovietologist Stephen F. Cohen, he got the bear back on its feet. And they didn't want the bear back on its feet. They wanted to dismember the bear into uh, many different pieces. And that's still the goal of the, rush, uh, of the West. Uh, this is Operation Barbarossa 2.0. And the people in, in Donetsk told me that. They, they're, very, they're very keen to say this is Operation Barbarossa. In Donetsk, which at one time was known as Stalino, until 1964, until the de-Stalinization in, in the Soviet Union, um, Donetsk was known as Stalino. And they have a, a, a slogan in Donetsk that goes, First Stalingrad, now Stalino meaning the Nazis were stopped at Stalingrad, now they're going to be stopped at Donetsk. And they definitely see, and the people of Russia see, this war as a war of the collective West against Russia, and that's what it is. And we reject that. We're Americans, but we reject that. We don't see Russia as an enemy, we see Russia as a friend. Um... As, as a long-term friend of the United States. You know, there, near the Arbat district, I think in the Arbat district, when I was walking there the other day, on a prior trip here last year, uh, I saw two statues right next to each other. One it was of Abraham Lincoln with the Russian czar at the time. Mm -hmm. And what does this symbolize? That the czar of Russia supported the Union soldiers against the South. Mm -hmm. And why? Because Russia had already gotten rid of serfdom. You know, Russia got rid of serfdom before we got rid of slavery. Uh, Russia supported the U.S. in the Revolutionary War as well against Britain. And then, of course, so the other statue was of, of the famous photo of the soldiers of Russia, the Soviet Union and America, shaking hands at the Elbe River during World mm -hmm. War II, right? These were, yeah, two statues next to each other. So, of course, the Soviet Union and the U.S. were allies in World War II, right? The point being that historically America and, and Russia have always been friends. There, you know, until 1948. Well, I mean, obviously the U.S. also tried to destroy the Soviet Union in 1918. Uh, but then we were friends again during World War II. But then after that, the U.S. took a very uh, aggressive stance towards the Soviet Union, and then against Russia after 1991. But our point is it doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. That we are historically friends, and we should be friends going forward. And there's a lot of Americans who think that. Um, so anyway, that's the message we come, come with when we come to Russia. Certainly the purpose of the conference was not peace. It was to to mount the forces, to organize the forces against Russia. I'm not sure it accomplished that, by the way, but that was the goal. But even the Swiss delegation there said, and they said this also at the Security Council when I was there, that there can't be a peace delegation without Russia. And Russia wasn't invited. So how could it be a peace delegation if one of the main stakeholders is not at the table? Mm -hmm. So it was not a peace summit. Again, I think it was the attempt of the U.S. who organizes all these things to organize Europe against Russia. But I don't think they're going to be able to do that. You know, Hungary, Hungary won't go along. Slovakia won't go along. And I think more and more countries will not go along with this program. So, mm -hmm. uh, Is uh, the uh, threat of the Third uh, World War and uh, the use of uh, nuclear weapons Yes, uh, and I, I talked about this at the Security Council, was my main message, that we are 
uh, hur hurling towards World War III and nuclear war. That this is a real possibility. Mm -hmm. The idea that, one, Joe Biden would say that Ukraine can use Western weapons to attack targets deep within Russia. Mm -hmm. And that Ukraine would attack radar systems designed to detect intercontinental ballistic missiles coming from the United States is a message that the U.S. is preparing for World War III and possible nuclear war. It can only be interpreted in that way. And the Russians are interpreting it in that way. And that makes this a very dangerous time. And it's more dangerous than even the Cuban Missile Crisis for one big reason, that our president now is not President John F. Kennedy, who was willing to negotiate with Khrushchev and find a solution within 13 days. Joe Biden or his administration are not interested in negotiations, are not interested in, 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 in finding a peaceful solution here. That's what what's makes the situation much more dangerous. And again, that is something we who are on this delegation categorically reject. We believe America should talk to Russia. Biden should talk to Putin and find a peaceful solution. Of course, it's never too late. But we may be point, reaching a point of no return. Um, but of course, it's not too late. But we need leadership in the West that is willing to sit down with the Russians and deal with their reasonable security concerns. That's the way this is going to get resolved. I believe Russia is willing to have those discussions, but the West has to be willing to do that. And so that makes it incumbent on people of the West, like people in the United States, to demand that their government do that, to demand that their government take us from the brink of World War III. I think the concern I have about the dollar, you know, dominance is that the U.S. uses that to try to uh, cajole other countries, to bully them, to overthrow governments. And that's why the world needs to move away from the dollar. Mm -hmm. You know, that will have difficult impacts on American citizens, you know, mm -hmm. including myself and my family. But it's the only way to, to be able to undermine the U.S.'s ability to dominate the world. Because the U.S. chose for Russia to be its enemy. And it is not inevitable. I think the Russians still want peace. I'll tell you, when we walk the streets of, Russia, of Moscow, for example, and people quickly figure out we're Americans, they show us so much love. Russians love Americans. Um, Russians don't hate America. They want to be friends with America. I know that to be true. And um, that is something we need to build upon, you know. Uh, so Russia is not a necessary enemy. It's a chosen enemy. It's an enemy of choice. And by the way, all the wars the West has fought since World War II have been wars of choice. They've been fighting them because they want to, not because they had to. And that time in history has to end. Those sort of wars of choice have to end. Dangerous, I don't know if it's dangerous. I think it, it definitely it can result in, in uh, certainly certain forms of repression, certainly job loss. I recently lost my job as a professor. Mm. And I know from what I was told that part of it was because of my views on Russia. Mm. You know, so people lose their jobs over it. Um, maybe at some point they'll come after us legally. That could happen. So there are risks. There are risks. But what is the alternative? You know, um, you, you must act in ways that are, you know, in accord with your conscience, right? And your beliefs. Or, or what, is, what, what is anything worth? What is life worth? It's not worth anything, as far as I'm concerned, you know. So, and I, I look to my predecessors from the United States, people like John Reed, who's buried in the Kremlin, or Paul Robeson, who was friends of the Soviet Union, you know. There's a long history of Americans willing to stand up and call for friendship with Russia. And um, we're, we're, we're amongst those people. And I'm proud to be one of those people. I, 
I'm very happy to be that, whatever the consequences.